All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I know it's been a while since I've been up here, apparently. Oh. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I like to go deep in the Word. I like to go into the Scriptures and actually allow the Scriptures to teach you guys. Amen. Right? Are you guys willing to go into the Scriptures with me? We're going to learn, and it's not going to be me speaking, so don't kill the messenger, okay? All right? I'm just the messenger. Don't kill me. All right? It's really what God has to say. And today we, we have a, we're really a little different because we have a little bit of a spicy lesson right now. Okay. You'll see, you'll see what I mean in a second. But before we start, let me, let's, let's bow our heads in prayer because we're going to go in there. Uh, Father God, thank you so much for just allowing us just to be here. And I pray that at this point in time, you just kind of set me aside and allow just the words to speak to every individual here. That you don't let me just say the things that I want to say, but you say the things that you want to say and you just speak through me. Thank you for the opportunity to just be able to speak to your people, to be able to just to share your convictions and your teachings, and just to help them just get closer to you in every aspect of their life. Thank you so much for just allowing us to be able to worship, to be able to come together, and to be able to just be able to learn from your word and allow it to be able to apply to our lives and help us just to get into a closer relationship with you and get every single one of us to heaven. I love you so much, and I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, so I have one question. We're going to start off, right? This is, a, this is a rhetorical question. I don't think you guys have to answer back, but I'm going to throw it out there. I want you to think, okay? Was Jesus a forceful man? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, you're like, wait a minute. I don't know about that. He was gentle. Uh, oh God, let, me, let me give you a definition, okay? Let me give you a definition. For a forceful person is this. is someone who has strong opinions, who demands attention oh. and action. And if you think of Jesus, didn't he have strong opinions? Oh, yeah. Didn't he like, hey, you're going to pay attention to what I'm teaching you. Yeah. And doesn't, doesn't he expect you to put those teachings into action? Yeah. Jesus was a forceful man. That's what he is. He literally started his ministry with one of the most forceful, direct, convicting lessons ever preached. Wow. And within that charge, you find his strong opinions regarding God's word that demand attention and action for those that listen. Come on. He literally says, those who have ears, let them hear. Yes. Are, you here to, are you here to hear God's word? Yeah. Amen. I'm about to say, I'm about to say, it's a famous line from John Cosby. You don't want to hear the word of God. <laughs> All right, you're here to hear God's word. Yeah. Amen. Well, I believe that you do. So let's go into it. This sermon was direct. He was clear. He spoke with authority. Come on, AJ. It was a 16-point lesson. Wow. Where he spoke about murder. Oh, okay. First point, right? There. Adultery. I'm like, God, you started off bad. Divorce. Yep. Really went for it. An oath, keeping your word. An eye for your eye. Loving your enemies. Giving to the needy. I don't know, but he's starting to sound pretty intense, right? Uh -huh. Prayer. I'm like, thank God he went to prayer. Uh -huh. Fasting. I don't know how he went to fasting. <laughs> Treasures in heaven. Do not worry. Wow. Judging others. I don't know if any of you guys judging people. But yeah. <laughs> ask, seek, and knock. He talked about the narrow and the white gates. He talked about true and false prophets. And he ends with the wise and foolish builder. I don't know, but that sermon sounds intense. Yeah. That's his sermon. It was a sermon that literally shook the ages. It was even more powerful than I have a dream speech by Martin Luther King. Wow. Because it wasn't just a dream. It was Jesus' convictions. He expected you to listen. Yeah. He expected you to apply it to your personal life. He expected that application of his word to your personal life to change you, to renew you, to make you more like him. That's a forceful man. Jesus was a forceful man that expected forceful actions that created forceful changes in the world yeah. because he called the changes in the hearts of every individual person that heard his words. Come on. This is all I like this guy. Yeah. <laughs> but are you here to change your heart? Come on, AJ. Are you here to apply 
his convictions to yourself. Are you becoming less like yourself and more like Jesus? Are you here to learn? To walk like Jesus, speak like Jesus, be more like Jesus. Are you here to change your personal convictions by making the convictions of Jesus yours? Wow. Or you just want to hear what you want to hear? Come on, AJ. Come on. Are you here to follow and to obey your Lord and Savior? Because sometimes we forget Jesus isn't just our isn't just your Savior. That's right. Lord. He expected each of us to make him Lord of each part of your life. Is Jesus still Lord of your life? Wow. Is Jesus Lord of every aspect of your life, of your mind, of your emotions, how you feel, of your strength? Is his words, his conviction still what you want and what you follow? Come on. Jesus preached a forceful 16-point lesson wow. that challenged 16 specific convictions in every man's heart and woman's. <laughs> Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. These were 16 convictions that changed the world that we find spread out through Matthew chapter 5, all the way from Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And it ends with this statement, Matthew 7, verse 28. Are you guys still with me? You're a little quiet already. It's just the introduction, guys. We're having deep into it again. When Jesus, when Jesus had finished saying these things, what are the things he's talking about? And all the 16 points. And even the setup for it, okay? The crowds were amazed at his teachings because he taught as one who had authority. So what does it tell us? And no one else taught him this way. Wow. No one taught in a forceful way that expected change in someone's heart. Oh. They tolerated sin. They didn't oh. expect repentance and wow. change. That is Lord. We're here to follow Jesus' story, aren't we? Yes. So like I said, don't kill the messenger. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm not, and, and don't worry, I'm not going to put 16 points today. Okay. I'm just going to focus on one, just one, okay, which is the title of our lesson. Y'all like, oh, no, it's going to go in. No. I'm going to preach one point from this. Wow. And it's about forceful giving. Wow. All right. Okay. Forceful giving. Now, keep this in mind, guys, that this conviction, this point, it wasn't preached by me. It was preached as one of Jesus' main points. In his sermon that he called the Sermon of the Man. Wow. But to really understand this specific point, the authority behind it, we have to go back to the beginning. I know y'all sound like Timon and Pumbaa, you know, Lion King, one and a half, going way back from the beginning. Hey. Jesus was trying to, we have to go back to him to see what Jesus was trying to teach. Come on. What Jesus was trying, what was Jesus' mindset behind that teaching? What was the context? Mm -hmm. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. Come on, Adrian. All right. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, so this is verse 1, starting in the beginning. This is the setup for the Sermon of the Mount, guys. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, we went up to the mountainside and sat down. Keep in mind, he's not preaching yet. He's just sitting. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. Yes, there was crowds. But the crowds were more like an audience that was kind of just listening in. They were listening into a teaching that he was actually addressing to his disciples. Oh. Like his followers. You know, I'm, just get, get, I'm not going to go into them. I'm just going to give a little, just going to set up the context, okay? The first thing he starts talking about is Beatitudes. You guys ever heard of those? Yes. The attitudes of being like a Christian. If you're a Christian, have Jesus' attitude. <laughs> okay, these are the Beatitudes. Where he addresses all the blessings that will come by having Jesus' attitude. Yeah. I don't know if you guys want to be blessed the way Jesus was blessed. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, it's crazy because it starts off like this. Blessed are the poor in spirit. I'm like, okay, okay. Blessed are those who mourn. I'm like, I don't know about that. <laughs> blessed are the meek. I'm like, I have to have submission. And et cetera, and et cetera. And then it keeps going and it ends right here. 
It wasn't really like, I'm like, where's, where's my blessing? Where's my stuff? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> right? But it ends that section, like that, that introduction a little bit. And he's still introducing it with this, with this statement on Matthew 5, verse 11. And it reads, blessed are you when people insult you. I'm like, ah, I don't think of blessing when people insult me. <laughs> right. I think of, uh, I'm going to hit you. <laughs> uh, persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. I'm a people talking bad about me? Man, damn, just tell me. What's wrong with you guys? I don't know if you guys feel that way sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like, you know? Who? He goes in verse 12, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. Oh, wow. Due to all this stuff. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So let's, 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 let's break down a little bit. Okay, again, this is just a concept, setting you guys up. What do we see here? You're blessed when you are persecuted. Because they're not persecuting you, according to scripture. They're just persecuting Jesus. Literally, they're persecuting God's word. You're just the messenger. It wasn't about you. Don't take it personal. Literally, we see in verse 12 that he states, you're, you're just the messenger. You're literally the prophet. A prophet in the Old Testament was just someone that spoke God's word. He's like, go say what I told you to say. Say exactly what I said. Don't miss anything I said. That's all that prophets did. They were just messengers saying God's word to the people. And the reality is, God's word is a little salty. Yeah, you know, I appreciate like, the, the term now because you know, like, you know, when you say like, "Well, that was a salt to talk," I probably meant something like, "Wow, oh, he went for it. <laughs> he said some truths. I don't know. My feelings are hurt a little. I don't know if I agree. I don't know if you guys ever had salt to talks." Yeah. Well, God's word is salty, yeah. and I think it's really funny that the next part of this 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 setup, he talks about being the salt of the world. Yeah, yeah. he's like, "Okay, let's talk about salt." <laughs> and it's interesting because if you put salt on something, it kind of like purifies and expands, especially if you put it on the wound and it opens it up even more. It starts exposing like ooze and things like that. It was kind of taught. Uh, it was used to cure in the beginning, especially in the first century. Wow. So it's interesting because Jesus knew this and he goes, because if you think about it, salty talks open wounds. Wow. Okay. And wounds expose hurt. Wounds are healed. You know, they're like scarred over. But if it gets open, it's still going to hurt. <laughs> yeah. But here's the thing. When you see the hurt, you can be healed. Yeah. And he was here all about getting you healed. Hence, salty talks expose, bring to the light, the hurt. Mm -hmm. And if you are hurt, then it means it can be seen. Because of the exposure. Because of the light. Now you can be healed. Hence, you're the light of the world. And that's the next part of this setup. It's like, hey, by the way, let me tell you guys who you are. You're the light of the world. How about you? I feel pretty nice. You're like, okay, bless, be awesome. So, okay, okay, light of the world. <laughs> Matthew 5, verse 14. We're just keep going, right? Help you out. You are the light of the world. Now, you think I, I just said that? No, literally, that's what he said. You are the light of the world. That's Jesus. I'm just saying. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. And he doesn't expect you to be hidden. Let's jump to verse 16. In the same way, let your life shine before others. Hence, he wants you to be exposed. He wants you to show it. That they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So, what is he talking to his disciples? What are we listening into in this conversation? Hence, Jesus was telling his disciples who they were. This is who you are. But those following you, is this who you are? A prophet? Someone that is a messenger that literally shares God's word? Wow. That's part of the context. The disciples of Jesus are the light of the world because Jesus calls his disciples, his followers, to have salty talks with them. And isn't it true? When you speak God's word to some people, it becomes a little salty talk? Yeah. You're like, why? It's like, dang, y'all, y'all, I'm all that. <laughs> You're bitter, <laughs> right? Because the truth exposes hurts. And God wants to heal you. And the hurt 
but you can't be healed if you don't see it first. So here's the thing. If you're a disciple of Jesus, you are meant to be a prophet. Yeah. Or in other words, a salty talker. Yeah. Hashtag salty talker. <laughs> All right, so, so you know, y'all for young people, I'm just throwing the hashtag in there. Yeah. So after Jesus clarifies all this, you know, I'm going to tell you who you are. Let me clarify a little bit. He tells them, you know, he tells them like his purpose. And then he kind of goes, tells them their purpose. So he's like, this is what I'm here to do. And what they are. And then he basically tells them what he's here to do. And now he starts telling them what they are here to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he starts breaking down the next part, which is, all right, guys, just so you guys on that. I'm not here to break the law. That's the next part of this. Okay? So he goes, Jesus was here to fulfill the law because he was calling his disciples to preach, to teach, to command the fulfillment of the law himself. By what? By teaching his commands, mm. his convictions, his forceful teachings. So far, this is shaking things up. <laughs> this is pretty forceful. Matthew 5, verse 17. Let me, like, just in case you don't believe me, let's go into the scripture. Let's keep going. Do not think I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. There it is. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Verse 19. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one, just one, of the least of these commands, teachings, and teaches others, there you go, say he's commanding a teaching, according will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever but whoever practices and teaches these commands, hence practices on themselves and teaches what they're commanding others to do, hence watch your life and doctrine closely, 1 Timothy 4.16, will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. 4.20, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, that was a pretty high standard at that point. You will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. I'm like, wait, what? I thought I was getting in. What just happened? We have to realize and not forget who the audience is here. The context. The majority of the audience was more than likely Jewish people who were waiting for a physical temple to come in. Yeah. They're like, let's destroy everything and start over. And he's like, no. And more than likely, they probably had certain points of view. I don't know. Let's see if some of these may relate to you. Maybe they doubted that they were going to get into heaven. But they wanted to figure out how to get in. Like they wanted to kind of know more. Maybe, maybe they were totally confident they're going to get in. Absolutely, I'm going in. But they didn't realize there was more. Or maybe they were like, I'm like, they're the guys like, man, I'm definitely not going in. But I'm here to listen anyways. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of you guys can relate to one of those things. <laughs> Yeah. I, I mean, I know I'm going to hell, but, you know, I, I like to hear the word. You know? Everybody's real quiet. <laughs> now, regardless of the mindset, regardless of where you're at, or maybe one of you guys is here, maybe, I, I know I've been under all these three. Yeah. Okay, at some point in my life. Okay? Regardless of the mindset, Jesus set a higher standard. How do we know that? Well, verse 20. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses, here's higher, than that of the Pharisees, which was technically the standard of righteousness at the time, and the teachers of the law, pretty much everybody who's supposed to know everything, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This statement was revolutionary. It was forceful. It shattered everything that they knew. It changed everything. This was a forceful statement that came through a forceful teaching taught by a forceful man. Wow. And that was Jesus. You want to be a man? 
be like Jesus. Okay, for the guys. Amen, bro. <laughs> but let's keep going. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were known to teach. Like, that's what they did. They taught a lot, actually. But they had no moral authority. That was the difference. Remember I said he spoke with someone with authority? They couldn't call people to follow God's commands because they themselves didn't live it. They were known as hypocrites because they didn't practice what they preach. But then Jesus comes and sets the standard higher. Come on, AJ. Jesus comes and says that to enter the kingdom, you have to do both. You have to practice it and you have to teach it. You have to teach it and you have to practice it. You have to be a disciple of Jesus and you have to make disciples of Jesus. Come on, AJ. Oh, I don't know about you, but all of a sudden, I'm everybody's lost. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> Sorry, wait a minute. You're following you guys still follow me? Okay. So, what do we see here? That Jesus makes it clear to the audience. Come on. Yeah. We're like the audience, we're just listening in right now to his disciples and those listening that disciples of Jesus are salty talkers Ooh. that bring light to the world because of their salty talks. Come on, AJ. Y'all got salty talks? <laughs> he tells that their purpose to be, he tells that their purpose to be righteous in order to be righteous and that their purpose of becoming righteous is by practicing what they teach and teaching what they practice. Watch your life in Dr. Yes. You save yourself and your hearers. First Timothy 4.16. And at this point, right after he pretty much explains all of this, right? We're in the context. Jesus makes it clear who the disciples are and the purpose that they're supposed to be doing. And he begins to teach that 16-point sermon. Oh, yeah. Okay. Just want to get context. But if you really look at it, there was really, really two main points to the Sermon of the Mount. To tell them who they are and their purpose, point number one. And point number two was... Basically, point number one, who they are, and point number two is really your purpose. Yeah. Uh, what are you here for? Let me tell you what you're here for. And that perp, that second point had like 16 subpoints. Yeah. <laughs> With the purpose of teaching the higher standard. Come on, AJ. So now he's teaching them. Now that you understand who you are, understand what the higher standard is, Learn it, come on, apply it to yourself, mm-hmm. and then go out and teach it. Wow, come on, bro. He's bringing the higher standard. All right, you guys still there? Y'all, real quiet. Yeah. And what was that standard, guys? It was Jesus's standard, it was Jesus's convictions, it was the convictions he actually applied to himself, and the convictions he was calling others to apply to themselves. How do we know that? Verse 19. Just on verse 19. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands, here's the command, and teaches other accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands, what commands are you talking about? Ones we're about to go into. Yeah. We're just going to look at one today, okay? So don't worry. Will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Come on. Right. So just look at one. That. Okay? We're going to look at forceful. Give it. And to do that, we're going to focus into two of Jesus' main convictions in this, in this passage. Teaching that Jesus taught within the Sermon of the Mount. Okay? Is treasures in heaven and do not work. Okay? Point number one. It's really the only point I got. So don't think of the only one. <laughs> Generosity to prosperity. Turn to Jeremiah 29, verse 11. You guys still with me? Yeah. All right. For I know, this is God speaking, not me, just so y'all know. For I know that the, the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Yes. Plan to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me. And I will listen to you. Come on. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Jesus wants us to be prosperous. 
but we're not able to see God's prosperity on us until we seek him with our whole heart. Until we go after learning, holding to the teachings, and applying Jesus' teachings, we're able to see the prosperity that God has for ourselves. Now, I'm going to help you out a little bit. Help us out, bro. Remember, Jesus was righteous. Yeah. You're all agree, right? Yeah. Awesome. Jesus was righteous. And he practiced a righteousness that surpassed the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Yep. Isn't that true? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Because he practiced it on himself. He literally preached what he practiced. He taught the same teachings he practiced on himself. But we, we have to understand is he practiced these teachings as a man that needed to enter the kingdom of God himself. As a man, he set the example. As a man, he taught. And as a man, he called others to follow him into heaven by practicing and teaching what he practiced and what he taught. Is he telling us to do exactly the same thing? Yeah. You're a man. Do what I do. And Jesus was prosperous. Don't you think Jesus was prospered? Didn't Jesus get everything? He literally got all Thor and heaven and earth. I don't know what else he can get. That's prosperous if you think about it. Like everything is his. As much as you can get. Right. Heaven and on earth. Jesus was prosperous, but he understood something that most of us miss because he was generous. Ooh. Jesus understood that generosity leads to prosperity. And the prosperity that God is talking about. Not that we're thinking. Right. That prosperity that God is talking about, that you can see in your life, you will only see when you seek God with your whole heart. Come on, okay. When you apply his teachings, his convictions, and practice it on yourself. Yeah. Wow. And you teach others to do the same. Wow. God plan brings prosperity. Yeah. And yeah. will bring prosperity to you. A plan that will give you a, a plan that gives you a future. And it won't harm you. Come on. Doesn't that sound great? Yeah. <laughs> but you need to seek him with your whole heart. You need to understand his teachings with his whole heart. You need to understand what forceful giving really is. Come on. Based on Jesus' perspective. Come on, AJ. Not your own. Yep. And his prosperity came through that understanding. And understanding that generosity... <clears throat> That generosity leads to prosperity. Jesus understood that God's prosperity for his personal life, like Jesus' physical life as a man, came through his generosity. It's generosity to prosperity, not let's be prosperous first so I can be generous. Wow. I don't know, y'all struggle with that. Wow. No, I didn't. Jesus was generous. Generous by definition means this. Y'all really quiet, but it's okay. No, we'll keep talking, guys. Generous means this. Showing a readiness. Are you guys ready? Oh, yeah. To give. Yeah. There you go. You're ready to give. More of something. Oh. I haven't even told you what it is yet. <laughs> As money or time. Ooh. Those are the two things that we value the most. Yeah. Money and time. Man, I don't know, but it's going to take a lot of time. Oh, bro, I'm going to make a lot of money. <laughs> like, yep. y'all want to go to Six Flags? Sure. <laughs> Anyways. But here's the thing. Showing a readiness to give more of something as money or time that is strictly necessary or expected. It means to go beyond the standard of giving. It means to go beyond what you expect. It means to go beyond what is necessary. It means to be generous as Jesus. And Jesus gave everything. His life, his money, 
We don't even know he had money. His money, his time, his understanding, his teaching. Oh, but it takes time to teach people, man. That's a lot of time. Like his convictions, he even gave his blood. Yeah. Why? I like asking why, guys. It's my favorite question. Why? Because he wanted God's prosperity for his life. Yeah. Remember, Jesus did come down as a man and had to go after God in the same way. Wow. That God expected any man to go after God. With his whole heart. Yeah. Why? Because Jesus walked among us. So that we could see a physical example of righteousness. At that point, not even the teachers of the law could do that. The Pharisees didn't do it. He's like, I'm going to send Jesus to show you an example that you can follow. And it was written down. So now you're like, why is the Bible there? It was written down so that no future generation would ever forget. So that everyone in every generation could follow that same righteous example as a man. Oh, now we'll get that excuse. Well, Jesus, you're God. Of course, you're going to be righteous. I'm like, nah, man, I've been, I've been as a man. I went down and did it like you. I don't know about you, but like, okay, God, I got no excuse. I got yeah. you. Right. I mean, they tell me that. I'm like, bro, I did it too. I'm like, man, you did it. I can do it too. Okay, let's go. There's no more excuse. Yeah. Come on. Mm. Come on, AJ. Come on. Come on, AJ. We're Come following on. down. Now, again, why? So we could see the results. Yeah. How about you? But we don't do things unless we see the results. Yes. You're like, all right, bro, I saw you do the, have you guys ever seen the, the 90, or like 90 day workouts? I forgot what it was called. Oh, P90X. Yeah. P90X. And you're all like, <laughs> but Brad's like, do I really want to do it? And then you look at the result, like, do I really want to? Yeah, yeah, okay, I do. They probably last about a week and then I quit. But anyways, but, but, the, but the result motivates me. We right. see results, guys. Y'all like, like, man, oh, man. <laughs> so we could see the results from someone who always see God with their whole heart wow. in everything. A man who wholeheartedly was faithful yeah. to God's will in every aspect of their lives. Why? So that it could be clear to us what the teaching Jesus was following what the teaching actually meant. So we can see clearly the result of practicing that teaching in your personal life and be able to practice it with confidence. Wow. That same teaching, because you got to see the results through Jesus' personal life as a man. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty convicting. <laughs> Little clapping. <laughs> Jesus had a clear understanding how everything worked and how to do it. Wow. Don't you guys like learning from people that actually know what they're doing? How about you, man? Like, okay, tell you, I got you. Let's do it. How did you do it? Right? He wasn't. He wasn't the blind leading the blind. Yeah. Jesus could see clearly. Oh. And he was leading the blind to see in the same way. He was bringing light to the world. Wow. Sure, you know, it's you. y'all the prophets. <laughs> Are you allowing Jesus' teachings to let you see clearly? Wow. To bring light into your life, into your convictions. Jesus believed, taught, and he called his disciples to teach. Generosity to prosperity. It's not let's be prosperous first so I can be generous. In the world, even in the first century, okay, even in the first century, in the time of Jesus, prosperity was measured by what you had. Wow. Your belongings, your treasure. And in the 21st century, we gather treasures. How? By collecting money. Mm-hmm. And we use money to get things. Mm-hmm. Belongings. But Jesus made it clear 
treasures expose your heart. And your heart will expose how generous you are. And your generosity will tell you how much God's prosperity you will see in your life. You're like, why am I not prospering? How generous are you? Jesus was not a fool. Jesus knew what God did, what he taught, what he expected, and Jesus always got God's results. P90X results. God's results really what he wanted, guys. The word says very clearly in God's word, Matthew 6, verse 21. Again, we're still in Matthew. That's, see, I'm being nice. Stand the same passage over here. Just keep moving forward. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's a very clear and direct statement. Yeah. Don't fool yourself. And I know we can, we can, because I know I have. We all can. Yeah. Wow. So most of you might not know my past a little bit, so I'm gonna share with you a little bit. Oh, yeah. So I I graduated from school. I was very, very studious. Ooh, and academically inclined in a lot of different ways. And I did music and all their stuff. But I basically graduated from a school known as this. Let me let me let me let me tell you the title. It's pretty intense. It's called John Marshall Highly Gifted High Ability Magnet School. Wow. They basically got all the smart kids and thought it was super fun and genius to put all the, the 90 percentile people in the same class. Wow. <laughs> and have them challenge each other. You know what it produced? A bunch of perfectionists. Yeah. <laughs> that went crazy. When they wow. So I graduated with a 4.32 GPA. <laughs> I used to go to school from 6 a.m. and ended my day around 10. Whoa. Yeah, 10 p.m. at night. I had extracurricular activities. I had over about 5,000 community service hours Whoa. in high school. I had more time in college. Oh. When, that, when that, that mission, the mission office saw my affection, they were like, this guy's been in. Yeah. I got an in in every, for every college I applied to. Wow. I could have gone to a, an Ivy League. I chose not to. Y'all real quiet. <laughs> but here's the thing. I didn't know God. I didn't understand who God really was. And I failed to understand how I got there. And God shook my life. College was the worst time of my life. It was the most adversity, the most affliction, the most pain, the most anxiety. The most point where I literally went from being completely at peace and no one could really touch how what I did to literally being so anxious to want to take my own life. Wow. But I challenged God. God did all these different certain things in my life that basically got to the point where my parents were in divorce. I saw like situations where people were like, basically that involves rape and all the other aspects of it it got so bad i'm like god there's no way why you're allowing all this to happen around me and i was like why god are you doing this my parents are about to divorce like what the heck is going on life is crazy <laughs> and i don't believe that you're being righteous to me i don't know if you guys have this type of conversations <laughs> but me and god we have real conversations okay guys I'm like, God, I don't know if you're a Christian God, but me and I, I shoot the city. Okay, I, I got no problem talking to God. Bridget can relate. She's like, yeah, me and God, we go. <laughs> okay. Sometimes you, you kind of have to talk to God real, man. God wants real. I ain't trying to fake it. You didn't fake it with you. Anyways, so I challenged. I was like, God, I don't understand it. I'm so tired. Like, I don't understand what's going on in my family. And here's the thing that you guys don't understand. And I'm going to help you understand. Yes. When I went to college, I had a 4.32 GPA. I had between $10,000 to $20,000 in my bank account every three months. I had paid my entire tuition. I had actually a dorm and I had no one actually taking care of me. I was no one's dependent. I was completely 
self-sustain in college. Actually, even before I started. And I had so many credits that I was actually considered a second year at the moment I stepped in college. Wow. How about you? That's a lot. <laughs> like I said, I could go after things, but I was not going after them. And when all these things happened, I couldn't understand why. I'm like, God, why? What's going on? I'm trying to, trying to help my family, trying to do all these things. You're just taking things away, but I'm trying to just work so hard to get my life right and help the people I care about. You guys relate? Yeah. And all of a sudden, there's so much anxiety. And this girl comes up to me one day in the lobby because I'm stressing out. I'm going, I'm just going to do my air drumming. If you guys know, I play drums. And I have these sticks. You ever seen the air drums from the 90s that have the sticks back? And it makes sounds? Okay, so this is real. Drummers do air drum. Okay. And I'm like doing my little beat like this. And I'm hitting my headphones. And I'm like, there's no drums. Okay, guys. I'm just like, Shh. like literally, that's all I'm doing, right? I'm like, I'm like rocking out in this lobby, right? Like, no, like, all right, I'm stressed out. I'm just going to do what I know. Like, I'm not going to be anxious. Let's play through. This girl comes up to me and goes like, hey. I'm like, hey. So, I'm already stressing out. This is the back of my head. She goes, God told me to come speak to you. Oh. And I'm like, all right, let me tell you what's going on. So I told her, it, like, all these and things like, oh, well, and, like, I'm like, and I was like, why? Like, you know, like, what? It's like, well, he's like, our, at that point in time when you guys, I had prayed to God. I'm like, I'm so stressed out. I'm so anxious. I don't understand anything. God, at least give me, give me something where I can go play drums. I couldn't even take my drums. In. I used to play, and I know you guys might not believe this, but I used to play between six to eight hours a day. Wow. Bam. I got so good that I got record deals offered to me. What? And I could have been basically a millionaire at age 22. Okay, this is from drumming. I had nothing to do with school. Okay, so you guys know. <laughs> okay, um, <clears throat> and basically, from the, and then I was stressing out, and God was always taking care of me, but I didn't realize. It. Yeah. And the girl comes up to me like, "Well, the thing is, our drummer broke his arm, like just broke his arm, like right now, like literally, like earlier today." Yes. And I was praying to find a drummer, and then I saw you, and I knew God was talking to me. So I went and talked to you. Do you want to come to this, this service? You know, it's, it's kind of like a, a campus thing. We don't really, it's not, it's not a Sunday service. We just, we just talk about God, and it's like a, but you can be part of the worship band. Here's the thing. I said I will play any genre except Christian. Oh. And I can play any genre. But I chose, I'm like, I'm not playing Christian. And I'm like, I'm so stressed out. I might actually consider this. So I went. This I, <laughs> wasn't that great. I went. I, there's some hope, but I didn't go there. <laughs> I went there. I listened to the lesson. This is great. Like these guys are joyful. They're, they're crazy. I'm like, why are they so happy? <laughs> What's going on? I'm like, this is not our church, by the way. <laughs> and they're like, they're so happy. They're, like, they're praying. I'm like, they're weird. <laughs> and then the guy after they're done, like I'm like, hey, so I so I heard like, do you want to do you want to join us? Do you want to be part of the worship band? In the back of my head, I'm like, do I really want to play Christian music? <laughs> and I said no. And I walked. Mm -hmm. And then the next week, we had midterms. And things are so stressed out. And the crazy thing about it, that I forgot to mention, was that she told me, it's like, but wait, what do you mean I can play in the drums? I was like, oh, and by the way, it's like, two blocks away right there and you have your own studio and you can play anytime you want oh my gosh. and i still said that answer i just didn't want it wow <clears throat> and next thing you know what happened i didn't play any drums i was stressed out and i was like you know what god forget it i'm done with you wow like you took everything but you can't take what you already gave me you already gave me all the abilities you gave me until i'm just i'm just forget you I don't know if you guys ever said something. You're like, man, that was probably really dumb. Yeah. <laughs> probably to your parents. You're like, man, I'm going to get so disciplined later. But I'm going to walk away. <laughs> I'm not going to take it back. I don't know if you've ever done that to your parents. Yeah. Okay, well, that's basically what I did to God. Yeah. God didn't like it. <laughs> I said the next, the next week on a Wednesday during my midterm, I knew everything for this chemistry test. I said literally on that midterm, 
knowing that I knew everything and I couldn't access the information in my brain to actually answer the questions of that test. <laughs> Keep in mind, I used to pray every single time before a test. God, you got me, right? This is where you want me to go. Let's go. I didn't believe in Christian. I was borderline atheist, basically agnostic. Mm -hmm. I just believed in higher power. And in short, <laughs> I failed that test. Uh -huh. And as I walked away from my midterm, from the lecture hall, I knew that I did something stupid. <laughs> and I knew I just chose to go against that. Wow. And then the anxiety started increasing. I became so anxious that I couldn't even put a sentence together. Wow. You guys don't know exactly, you might not know what I mean, but I'll give you an example. If I want to say the dog chased the cat, it was so overwhelming that it was paralyzed. Yeah. Like just putting that sentence together in my brain, mm. not even writing it down. Right. just in my brain that it was paralyzed. It got to the point that I actually had to withdraw from school. Mm -hmm. I actually didn't finish my first year of school oh. in college. But I had so many credits that when I came back, I was still a second year. <laughs> God took care of it. But he, he planned this humbling process. Yeah. Yeah. And, in, and I withdrew from school for six months. And all I can do was being anxious. <laughs> and the only thing I could read without overwhelming anxiety to the point that I, it was, it was like literally shattered and I can't even explain it too much, was the Bible. <laughs> Which I chose not to read. <laughs> I was waiting for the class for a second. <laughs> it was in Spanish. It was, it, was, it was in like old English, Queen style. There's, there's not King James, it's Reina uh, Rivera, something. Different. Anyways, long story short, it's basically Queenie style. And I was like, I'm like, I'll try it. So I started with Genesis and I'm like, forget you. And I literally for six months purposely try to run away from you. Wow. And everything was like, God wants you. God's looking for you. God's trying to teach you. God's wants to save you. I'm like, yo, God, leave me alone. I get to the point where I'm just like a hermit. Basically, I'm like, oh, no way. God's after me. I kid you not. It was pretty intense. My family, like, what's wrong with I'm like, <laughs> God chased after me. Yeah. And, um, and I, one day in the morning, I wake up one morning. I was like, I, I just have to surrender. And I saw this, this TV. God used all aspects to King, yes. give me here. <laughs> this TV show that was kind of Christ, basically Christian-based. And... It's like, if you, if the people that are meant to teach are not teaching, then what happens to everybody else? Yeah. And I don't know why it hit me. Sorry, I get for it. It hit me and I'm like, okay, fine. I surrender. Oh. And at that point, my anxiety started kind of minimized, but it wasn't gone. I went back and luckily because it was a summer and summers don't count in school, <laughs> called vacation times. <laughs> I actually came in, still as a second because I had so many credits that I actually was never behind. Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> I didn't think it was cool, but it's cool. <laughs> you know, and I went in and um, I was like, okay, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Wherever you want. And I jump in the elevator. My dad has a really embarrassing conversation that your dad's always have with yeah. like the girl that's right there. And he turns over and he tells her in Spanish, you're going to take care of him, right? to a girl in the elevator that I all know. <laughs> and we just met like the second we stepped into the elevator. I don't know about you, but that's a little awkward. Yeah. But I was like, so I go to the girl later on, afterwards, I'm like, I'm so sorry, my dad's crazy. <laughs> it's very serious, that's what he's saying. So, you know, it's cool. And he's like, hey, yeah, no, it's all fine. Don't worry about it, it's cool, whatever. Right, I'm like, okay, cool. Hey, I was like, she's like, hey, I'm like, what's up? Like, what are you doing? The rest of the Nothing. I just. I'm back in the dorms, literally. Like, what do you want me to do? It's like, are you doing anything? Like, no, nothing. Well, we have this Christian thing. <laughs> Amen. Do this. I told you it was funny, right? <laughs> it's Christian thing. So I end up going. And I'm like, fine, God, surrender. Go. And they do the whole worship thing all over again. 
they do their, you know, be, preaching. I'm like, and they don't preach in campus, guys. They just share, you know, devotion, devoted to God. Okay? Yeah. And, uh, and I'm like, okay, fine, guys. I surrender. And I prayed. I'm like, hey, God, I got it. I pray. I'm going to let you learn my life and actually guide it. Okay. And at that point, that's probably the, the moment I actually felt peace mm-hmm. when I finally surrendered through prayer to God after running away for six months. Wow. I wouldn't pray to God, not during that time. I was like, nope, <laughs> I'm not talking to you. <laughs> and uh, moving forward, I messed up later. <laughs> and I didn't realize that I had no idea what it meant to follow. Wow. And I had a crazy prayer for God, where I was like, God, <clears throat> make it clear to me what it means to follow. Wow. I'm so tired of being stressed out. I'm so tired of getting chased down. I'm so tired of all this pain. I'm so tired of all these things that I know you're allowing to happen, but I don't even know exactly what the heck they all mean. But if you don't answer, I'm okay going to help. Wow. It needs to happen today at 7 p.m. on the dot or I'm out. Wow. I'm done. I'm so done. Don't, okay, I, I told you guys, I, I, I battle with God, okay? <laughs> I'm like, I'm done. Like, I can't do this anymore. Like, I might as well just take it. Okay, like, it makes no sense, right? Well, sir. And um, fast forward, basically, that same day, I forgot about the prayer because I did it in the morning. I was stressing my head off. And um, at 7 p.m. on the dot, I remember really clearly, there's the, in UCLA, they have these bells, bell towers. And all I hear is this bell tower ring. Seven on the dot. Here's the crazy thing about it. My class doesn't end at seven. It ends at eight. But my teacher decided to end it early for whatever reason. So I leave. And I walk out. And there's this, this spot that I told God, God, you have to have me meet this person right here at 7 p.m. So I know that it's you. And it's not Satan. Because that's either Satan, I'm sorry, it's either a Brad power and you're just going to torture the heck out of me for the rest of my life. Or it's God. And I need to know what the heck is going on. I don't know if you guys ever had an experience. Oh, yes. All right. <laughs> He's like, just like, I did. <laughs> gotcha. And then, um, and right at the seven, literally as the, the bell rang, that person was standing right there. Um, as I was walking down, I'm like, with my headphones, I always have headphones on, I guess, by the way. The headphones, I'm like, wrap it. They weren't like the cool wireless. You have the wire. So I'm like wrapping it in my hand. And I'm like, there's absolutely no way this person's standing. But I could see it. So I did the conversation I needed to do. God answered my question. And as I walk away, because part of that prayer was, if he answered, I would follow him for the rest of my life. Wow. That was the end of it. And as I walked away, I remembered, oh, snap. It was like in parts of that prayer. It's that conversation. And I realized I had no idea what it meant to follow. So I ran away. I ran into the, the, the closest Bible discussion I, like I knew about. <laughs> and I went straight into there. And I'm like, I'm just going to listen and figure out what's going on. I know, it's interesting. I, I have a lot of figuring out what's going on. And, um, <laughs> and I sit there and they happen to actually see something that was useful. They actually said, okay, if you want to really get close to God, you have to read your Bible. Makes sense. Makes sense. I don't have a Bible. I don't have a Bible. And this guy, guy turns over to me and goes, what are you thinking? I need a Bible. He's like, here's a Bible. He hands me a Bible. And it was a NIV, uh, today's NIV. Still good. And that's the Bible I used to study the Bible. And after I got that Bible, I ran straight to the leaders. And I'm like, tell me why is this happening? And they look at me and go like, I have no idea. I'm like, you know what? This is so crazy. This is all right. You know what's going to happen? I'm going to walk down the street. I'm going to meet this homeless guy that claims himself to be Apostle Smith. Hands he claimed to be Apostle. And this random dude in the street is going to tell me what's going on. I told him. It's crazy. You guys have never heard this. Right? And, and then, you know, the, the leader turns with me and goes, I wouldn't mock God. He might just do it. 
So I literally, I walk out the spritz at like, like 9 p.m., 9.30. It's pretty late. And if you know anything about the homeless people in uh, UCLA, because at this point in time, I really was trying to seek God with my heart. And I was actually serving in the homeless ministry and feeding people because I understood one thing. Jesus served the poor. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, I'm doing that. That's all I know for sure. Teachings, I have no idea. Doctrines, I have no clue. I don't even know what it means to be saved. I'm like, that's what it is. Okay. And I go on. <clears throat> And uh, I walk down, and as I'm walking down, I see the homeless man that claims to be apostles. Okay. And I'm like, of course, it's that day. <laughs> so I just sit next to him, and, he, and I'm like, so what you doing? I'm just waiting for something. Um. So I turn over to him, and I start telling him everything that just happened with that prayer. First time someone actually opened the Bible. It go, and goes straight to Gideon and teaches me about the, the fleece. Gideon's fleece. Yeah. Like, see, what you did was you did a fleece. I'm like, that makes sense. That makes sense. <laughs> Got you. I made sense. And he answered everything I had to do. And I was like, that was weird. And I leave going like, but I still don't know what it means to follow God. So I go and I pray. I'm like, God, just tell me exactly who I need to go to, to, to study the Bible. And you put something in my heart and I end up basically calling this girl. Her name was like, well, calling this girl. And I was like, fine, I'll, I'll study with a girl. I don't even care right now. Let's find out where it goes. It so happens that that particular girl went to Bible studies that were led by this church. Wow. For a whole year. And never told me. But we were friends. And that day when I go up to her and I'm, I was going to tell her, she's like, she's like, she, she goes, no, 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 hold on, hold on. I need to go to this thing. And, uh, but you don't have to come. You can just stay here. Because I, I met her at her apartment. And I'm like, well, what, what thing are you going to? It's a Bible discussion. You don't have to. And I'm like, oh, I'm all about God now. So let's go. <laughs> so I go with her. I'm like, as long as I'm going with God, I'm good. I, that's, that's my promise. I'm just going to go wherever God's at. And so I go. I jump into that, uh, go into that Bible discussion. They lead an awesome discussion. I'm like, I'm going to study with these guys. I like these guys. Right? <laughs> like, go there. Um, I decided I was going to stay with them. They didn't know this, by the way, at all. Like, this kind of never happened. You know, share with me. They invited me to Sunday. I actually ended up in Mexico. But the week later, I said, no, I'll be here for sure on Thursday. For sure. This is my Bible group right here. Bam. <laughs> Stand my feet. I'll be right here. And then uh, next Thursday, I come in, turn to the Bible talk leader, and I'm like, Hey, yo, what are you doing Monday at 7 p.m.? I don't know. I guess I just like 7 for whatever reason. <laughs> 7 p.m. It's like nothing. Cool. Let's do a Bible study. Uh, <laughs> I already knew it. I guess everybody at this point was starting to Bible study. Everybody wants to. I don't know why. But I'm really stressed out. I guess. And then um, I already knew I was going to go. So I just kind of went ahead. <laughs> studied the Bible with me. And then uh, that night, I basically studied seeking God, the word, discipleship. Because as we end the study, I basically ask them, they ask, um, they ask me, if you have any questions, let it, like, just go ahead and say. I'm like, Lenny, honestly, I have one question. How do you become a Christian? <laughs> Studied. Here we go. <laughs> and that's how I ended up here. <laughs> but here's the thing. I challenge. Now we're going to go back to forceful giving. <laughs> I challenge God and claim that God couldn't take anything away from me because mm. he already gave it to me. Wow. He took everything away and he took it because I became arrogant. And the truth was, you're either going to be arrogant or ignorant. And I was both. <laughs> I was arrogant and ignorant. So it wasn't good for me. <laughs> I didn't realize that I really didn't know what Jesus did. I didn't understand God's heart. I didn't understand God's sovereignty. I didn't even know what he expected. I didn't know or understand God's plan for my life. So I did basically what I just told you. I challenged God. And I did exactly what it says in the scriptures. Deuteronomy chapter 8. I don't think I'm going to change. I don't think I'm going to finish this lesson. Y'all want to keep going? Yeah. <laughs> I just want to make sure y'all hear what's going on. You sure? Yeah. You guys want to hear the word of God? I'll keep going. 
There's there's no more illustration. There's no more of my, my life. I promise. It's all scripture from this point on. All right. Just making sure. I just want to make sure you all understand where we're at. Okay. Deuteronomy chapter 8, starting in verse 17. You may say to yourself, this was me, my power and the strength of my hands has produced this wealth for me. Mm, doesn't that sound exactly what happened? But remember the Lord your God, which I had no idea. <laughs> for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Wow. I just told you guys I had almost $4,000 in my bank account. Everything was paid. I had more money than my parents. As a 19-year-old kid, 18-year-old kid. And so confirms his covenant. Because he wants us to be fruitful. He does want us to be prosperous. But there's a point to his prosperity that he expects from us. He expects us to be generous. Which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. My intelligence, my ability brought me all that money. Brought me all that money. Even brought me the whole potential of being a record. Yeah, y'all. Like I said, I could be a millionaire. Just no. But I failed to understand God's plan for my life and especially how to apply the word it to my life. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 19, it reads, I'm teaching you exactly what the teaching is, so just follow me. Okay? Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 19. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions, <laughs> And the ability to enjoy them. I really like playing drums, guys. It's great. Until I couldn't do it. <laughs> Amen. To accept their lot and be happy in their toil. This is the gift of God. <laughs> it wasn't by my strength that I got the things I had. It was because it was God's gift to me. I just didn't realize that it was coming from God. Proverbs 10, verse 22. We're going to keep going. You all with me? Yep. Yeah, we're going to come back to Matthew. We're going to go <clears throat> shooting scripture here. Proverbs 10, verse 22. The blessing of the Lord brings word wealth. The blessings of the Lord. If you're humble, God will bless you. He wants you to be humble. He, the meek, remember? The mourning, all that. Okay. The plans of the, I'm sorry. The blessings of the Lord brings wealth without painful toil for it. How about you? You don't want to, you guys want to be in pain? No. God doesn't even want you in pain. He actually says that he wants to bring you wealth. But you have to understand what it comes from, how it works. Because if you seek him with all your heart, he will bless you and give you more prosperity so you can do exactly what he wants with your prosperity. To be generous. Jesus was generous. If you keep going, let's go to Proverbs 21, verse 5. The plants of the diligent if you're diligent with seeking God with your whole heart, what's going to happen? Lead to profit. You're going to get the profit of God. Don't you want to see like the way that God wants to profit you? Yeah. I don't know. Like, some of you are like, bro, I want to get the same profit as that CEO over there. What if you get the same profit that God has? Yeah. Be like, you think you're rich, man? You have no idea. <laughs> Let me tell you what I'm rich with. <laughs> the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty because i took haste into going after god god took everything i literally lost everything even my ability i don't, I don't want any of that for you guys trust me it's not it's not good to be under hand, the hand of god <laughs> proverbs 28 verse 20 a faithful person which i was not at the time will be richly blessed and every song I was seeking God during that time, I'm like, why are you so happy? I'm like tortured over here. What the heck is going on? It's like, why? I'm smarter. I probably could do three times more than he could. I, I get it. I was arrogant. Okay. <laughs> Y'all looking at me like, seriously, you thought that way? Yes, I did, guys. Okay? I did. It's very conceited. That's what happens when you put a bunch of 10% down the same class. Anyways, <laughs> Proverbs 28, verse 20. A faithful person will, will be richly blessed. But one eager to get rich will not go unpunished. Wow. You want to get rich? That's the result. Go get rich. I'm just, I'm just warning you guys. I said, don't kill the messenger. <laughs> okay. Proverbs 28, verse 22. The stingy, which means that you want to live with it, are eager to get rich. If you're eager to get rich, 
I dare say you're stingy. And are unaware that poverty awaits them. Poverty can come by not having actually a relationship with God. Mm-hmm. And he takes it away from you. Mm-hmm. First Timothy 6, verse 17. I know we're going through scriptures, guys. Can you start with me. Mm-hmm. Command those who are rich in this present world, right here, guys, not to be arrogant. Oh. I told you guys I was arrogant. I'm like, I'm like the prime example right here. <laughs> Nor to put their hope in wealth. I thought if I gain all the money, I could help myself and my family. I was going after that American. And I could have succeeded. I just didn't acknowledge God. Which is so uncertain. But to put their hope in God, which I did not. Which richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Yes, God wants, I can have fun, man. I didn't want to torture you. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to give to others is a good deed, to be generous with your wealth and your teaching, to do it the same way that Jesus did, it's good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. God's going, you want to be prosperous? I want to give you all this, but here's the thing, generous and share. Sounds like when you were a kid, right? Share yeah, with your brother. Yeah. I don't know about you guys, but it was always like, right. verse 19, in this way, if you're generous and willing to share, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of life that is truly life. Go to Second Corinthians chapter 9. Huh. I told you there would be no more illustrations. I'm just going straight. Second <laughs> Corinthians chapter 9. Starting in verse six, you guys with me? Yeah, I'm trying to talk slow. I know. Don't worry, guys. Taylor, Taylor's on me. She's like, you talk too fast. You know, she makes sure that he wants everybody to hear the word. Remember this: whoever sows sparingly, meaning if you're basically only putting a little bit in, you will only get a little bit out. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously. More than is necessary or expected, whether time or money, will reap generous more than is necessary or expected from who? From God. Yeah. Who has everything in you. Yeah. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly. God doesn't want you just to be like, or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly more than you can possibly imagine actually talks about it in malachi 3 hmm. so that in all things at all times so it means god wants you to be able to do and share and be generous at all times having all that you need you will be abound in every good work. jesus had so much generosity and ability to give that he continued to give and hence he did good deeds and good works he was generous in every aspect of his life. Even when he didn't have money, he produced food and fish and bread from what? Two bread and two fish, was it? Yeah. I don't know about you, but I'm like, man, that's a lot of money. Yeah. I don't know how you did it, but you did it. <clears throat> Verse 12. This service, and what service is he talking about? Your generosity. Your ability to gain wealth from the ability that God already gave you. Yeah. That performance of understanding that it's a generous aspect of giving from your own will to share. This service that you perform is not only supplying, meaning that you're actually giving something that someone can use, supplying the needs of the Lord's people, not just church, but also overflowing in every expressions, multiple, of thanks to God. Because of the service, again, what service? Your ability to use your abilities to create wealth, to be able to share, to be willing to give to someone else so that people can say, thank God. Because of the service which you have proved yourselves, others, not you, will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of making Jesus Lord of the gospel of Christ 
and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. That's everyone, guys. And in their prayers, God had a guarantee. For you, you, their hearts will go out to you. People will actually pray because of what you've done. Yeah. Surpassing grace. I'm sorry. Hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Why is it grace? He was so prosperous. He wants to give you so much unmerited favor that he gave it to you. Thanks be to God for his undescribable gift. It's generosity to prosperity. Because God made a generosity to prosperity cycle that exposes how much you actually, you actually apply God's word and God's teachings in your own personal life, to your own personal convictions. Are you striving to be generous as Jesus was? Mm. Jesus was so generous that he was willing, willing to give his own eternal life in exchange for our eternal death. Jesus gave his blood for our sin more than was strictly necessary or expected from a physical man to do. Jesus had to become the example of a willing and generous man that was willing to give everything he had for the temple of God, the church, the body of God. Jesus' heart showed generosity from Jesus as a man, the example that was valued with the value of eternal life itself, which now echoes through eternity from generation to generation. I fail to understand all of this because I fail to understand that God was using my worldly treasures to expose my heart, my hurt, and how far my heart was from him. In the first century, God uses belongings, he uses money. So in the 21st century, you know what he does? He does the same thing. He's consistent. God will use your money to show you your heart. Yeah. That's the purpose of money to God. Yeah. To be used as a mirror for you. For us. To see and expose your heart. A mirror doesn't lie. It tells you exactly what you look like. <laughs> Ask yourself, is your heart applying and holding deeply to God's will? to his teaching, to his convictions, or is it going against it? What is the mirror of your heart telling you today? Wow. Don't be fooled. Right. The word of God says in Matthew 6, verse 21, for where their treasure is, there your heart will be also. And it continues in Matthew 6, verse 22. You guys ready? Yeah. All right, guys, I'm going to have to whew, wrap this up, but you guys with me? Yeah. Give me 15 more minutes, I'll probably be done. Promise, I think. Matthew 6, verse 22. I told you guys we're going to preach. We're going to go. You guys sure? Yeah. Come next week if you guys come I can stop right here. All right. Verse 22. Now I in the lamp. Verse, uh, Matthew 6, verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, let's take it back a little bit. Remember that this was part, Matthew 6 was part of the Sermon of the Mount. Jesus just told his disciples that they need to have salty talkers. Yep. They need to be salty talkers that bring the light to the world. Hence themselves with the word of God. And what do lamps do? The same thing. God taught physical examples to teach spiritual, use physical examples to teach spiritual principles. Wow. The lamp does the same thing. It brings light. It exposes things. Let's think physical. What does the eye do? The same thing. It does the same thing for the body. The eye is the only part of the body that can actually can and control how much light comes into it. Mm. There is no other part that can do this. Okay. Remember that Jesus, Jesus used the physical representations like the eye, the lamp, the light to teach us spiritual principles. 
And to Jesus, the church is the body of God. You're the body of God. You're the physical temple of God. And your eye allows you to do what? To see how much light gets into your heart. Which can only be found inside your body. You can't be, it can't be seen. No one else except possibly God can see your heart. Yeah. Physical eyes is the only part of the body that lets light into it. Now, physically speaking, we use our eyes to determine what? What we want and what we need. Yeah. That pretty much breaks down everything that you ever buy. <laughs> because what we need is determined literally what we see. Hence, sisters, window shopping. <laughs> Y'all don't buy, but you're like, I'm gonna buy that when I get money, buy that when I get money, et cetera, right? <laughs> but, but, but here's the thing. And based, and based on the light that comes through your eye is what we use to examine what we want to take for ourselves, mm-hmm. what we want and what we need. Because if light didn't come through, you couldn't examine it. And if anything, you'd be like, oh, give me a lamp right now. I want to make sure I can see. Is there a defection in it? You know, is there a... The bass, I don't know. Is it a good product? Is it defective? You ever notice, like, here's the flashlight? You know, you expose it with even more light. Light is an invaluable tool that we use to determine what we give and what we take, what we need and what we want. And things that you want and need will test the generosity of your heart. But let's go a little deeper in the scripture. You guys ready? Yeah. You guys notice that it said, If your eye is healthy, right? Well, healthy in the Greek actually meant generous. Go ahead. Go ahead, bro. You know, a readiness to be willing to give more than is, you know, strictly necessary or expected. (laughs) And unhealthy meant stingy in that specific passage, which means that you're just everything back to yourself. We just saw from the proverb, you're stingy, God's going to. Take things out. You're going to punish you. (laughs) The ability to receive a lot of light is a healthy eye. The ability to receive little light is an unhealthy eye. So it means that the ability to be really generous shows the health of your heart. And the ability to be stingy shows the unhealthy part of your heart. The light you receive is based on how much discipling of the word you have actually taken into your heart and applied to your own heart and made it your own conviction. Come on, AJ. It exposes how much your heart actually holds to the teachings. It shows how much word, the light of God, is being put into you, either through the word of God, your quiet times, or through the people that are there to teach you that God has sovereignty, through his sovereignty, put there for you. Yes. How much light is being able to change your convictions of your heart? If you have Jesus' perspective, you're going to be generous. Yeah. Generous is showing that readiness to give a more of something, whether it be money or time, that is strictly necessary or expected. But just in case you guys don't believe me, I'm going to give you one more example. Money, going yeah. to a close. Yeah. But let me give you an example from the scriptures, not even about me that Jesus used to teach how God uses money, your treasure, in, as a mirror of your heart. Mm-hmm. Let's go to Matthew 12. I'm sorry, Mark 12. Mm-hmm. Promise, Chris, I'm coming to land. <laughs> Verse 41. Sorry, guys. I took... Go over. Go over. Verse 41. You guys there? Yeah. Jesus sat down opposite to the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple. God uses physical representations to teach spiritual principles. And here you see that God himself, Jesus, sat opposite of where people would give to watch what they were giving. Because he was trying to determine how generous they were from their heart. It It was a mirror that he could see. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money to the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins. And they even said very small right there. Worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, 
I don't know about you, but this must have been phenomenal for Jesus. He's like, yo, 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 get over here, get over here, get over here. I need to teach you something. The last time he taught this was a 16-point sermon. <laughs> so like, this is pretty good, <laughs> right? Calling the disciples to him, Jesus said, truly, I tell you. Sorry, guys. <laughs> this poor, I know, this is where the Latin part came out. Truly, I tell you, this poor widow, and if you're a widow, you have to determine, you have to remember this. That means you have no husband. And more than likely, because she only had two very small copper coins, she also didn't have sons. It was basically almost saying that she was homeless because all the earnings go through the man. So to be a widow with no husband and no sons meant you were really, really broke. Okay? Poor widow, and they also said poor widow, <laughs> has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything. Wow. Her life was only worth two very small copies. Wow. She had all she had to live on. Wow. Now check this out. The widow was generous. He gave more than even the scriptures actually says a poor person needs to give. Wow. More than was necessary or expected. She was ready in her heart to give those two copper coins that were the value of her very life. Everything got new. She had to live on is what she gave. More than God found strictly necessary or expected, this action was so significant to Jesus in, that Jesus had to make it into a teaching. Mm -hmm. A teaching moment to teach his disciples a spiritual principle. You gonna wanna hear the spiritual principle? Yeah. Your giving to God is a measurement of your generosity, not your prosperity. Yeah. This physical action exposes your heart. Not to men, but to yourself as a mirror and to God. You guys have seen that YouTube video where that person gives like 100 bucks to homeless people all over the place? Yeah. You ever seen those? Yeah. You ever notice that right after he gives them money, what's the first thing that comes out of their mouth? Thank you. Thank you. You ever notice that it says there in their prayers, it goes back to God mm. and he hears you. He created a prosperity cycle where he knows if you used your ability to make wealth and if you use that wealth to be generous. And if your generosity is a physical extension of the good deeds that even Jesus himself would have done if he was alive today. Mm. You yeah. give generously in the same way. Yes. God confirms it. Through those prayers, you cannot fool God. Don't think that if you're not generous, God doesn't know. Yeah. And that's how he confirms, like, man, there's a hundred people praying because you were so generous. Let me give you a thousand dollars. There's 10,000 people that heard the word of God and the good news. Let me give you a hundred thousand dollars. God's like, I got it. Come confirm, check, balance, check, balance. Let's get more, but check, balance. I'm not about you, but I, I, I expect, I'm like, man, I give my God, I got you. You got me, right? right? I'm excited to see what God's going to outgive me. Yeah. Malachi 3 says that God will outgive you. It's the only thing we can test God in. It's like, see if I won't outgive you. And the floodgates won't open. He's like, I'm waiting for this prayer, so I know for sure it happened. Yeah. Trust me, I know. Can't pull him. I'm like, I'm like all right, God, let's do this. <laughs> what do we see here? This action of the widow was so significant to Jesus because it represented the value that she herself placed in her heart towards the temple of God, which was life himself. To Jesus, the temple was nothing. It was just a physical representation. This generous gift showed Jesus how much value her heart, put, had, her heart had towards the temple of God. And the widow's heart echoed exactly the same heart that he had towards the spiritual temple of God. And that heart trans would translate into a spiritual temple. He knew this. Keep this in mind. Jesus was homeless. Sounds like the widow. Jesus didn't have any money. Sounds like the widow. Jesus, all he had was life. Yeah. All he had was life to give. Just his life. And in the same way, the widow only had two copper coins. 
that represented the value of her life at that moment. Wow. She was a widow, which meant she had no husband. She had no kids. She probably had, was completely homeless and poor. She only had two copper coins. Jesus was overwhelmed with joy for this woman's generous, generous gift that it ref, because it reflected the same heart that he had towards God's temple. John 12, verse 19 to 20. You guys don't have to turn there. Jesus answered him, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. God knew it was all about, Jesus knew it was all about building God's temple. They replied, it was taking 46 years to build this temple. Again, the physical temple. And you're going to raise it in three days? Jesus, God, Jesus gave the only thing he had. And that was his very life for the temple. He had nothing else but what? Eternal life himself. Mm -hmm. And like the widow, he willingly gave it to establish the temple of God. How much are you willing to give? What heart are you exposing to God when you give today? Does your generous gift mirror the same heart of Jesus? Like the widow did? Do you still remember that treasures, that the treasure God has allowed you to obtain, to gain, were obtained by you from using the abilities that he gave you before you were born? Does your generous gift really reflect the grateful heart that you have towards God? Do you deeply understand that everything you have was given to you by God through the abilities he gave you to produce wealth. Do you fully understand that prosperity doesn't come before generosity, but that generosity is before prosperity? And that God will make you prosperous based on your generosity. But your generosity is a reflection of how deeply you're seeking God with your whole heart and how much your heart is a reflection of the applications of Jesus' convictions, his forceful teachings onto your own personal life, Amen. your convictions. Are his convictions your convictions? Jesus was a forceful giver that gave forceful, that gave through forceful generosity. Let's continue to give our generous, to be generous, to give generously, and ensure that our generous gifts are a mirror that reflect the very heart of Jesus. To God be the glory, and to us be the joy. Amen.